As I mentioned in class that first week, normally I wouldn't go over these PowerPoint presentations that uh, Arlene Fink, the author of our chapbook or our textbook, sorry, has put together in a systematic way. I would normally just post the notes or essentially copies of the slides for you to guide you through your reading. But since we're losing today due to weather, I wanted to spend some time going through uh, what Arlene Fink has put together in this slideshow because there's a couple of things in there that I would have talked about in class and sort of expanded upon and provided additional information for. If you look at the initial information in the chapter, so I'm looking, I'm using the fourth edition here now, so the one from um, 2014, and as I'm looking at the initial information in the chapter, so basically pages 48 through to about um, page 54 or so-ish, essentially these are a lot of things that um, Kim went over in class last week as we were going through and discussing how to go about searching for things and, you know, different types of criteria that you would use. So they talk here about, you know, the information about um, how you would, once you essentially get those types of things, how do you start screening for all of that information? Because many of the searches that you've had have folk likely yielded somewhere, you know, in a hundred or so, maybe hundreds of potential items that you've got. So the next question is, how do you start screening for what's useful and what's not? Now, one of the things we did um, a couple of weeks ago was we started to look at essentially how you can start to scan through some of these documents in a more efficient way and how to focus your um, your searching or your reading of all of the items that you're coming across. And that is really kind of what um, Fink is talking about when she talks about a practical screen. So when she refers to the term practical screen, she's essentially talking about that process we went through um, when we had those journal article samples in class where we were, were essentially trying to figure out how do you get through these things in five or six or seven minutes um, to just to determine if it's something that you want to spend more time with. Now the methodological screen is actually something a little bit different and something we'll spend a little bit more time on in separate videos as we go through here but I'll talk a little bit about this through Fink's perspective. The how the parts of a manuscript um, video that you've got coming up will provide a little bit more information about this in terms of you know how to look at you know the the skeleton of a manuscript and where you should find specific things and the level of information that should be provided in each of them but I want to spend a little bit of time going through uh, what Fink has described in her chapter so um, you know this practical screen information stuff again that stuff that you'll either grab from the screens that Kim was showing you or that you'll sort of look at as you're going through in that you know initial six to eight minutes um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this it's this methodological screen that I really want to spend a bit more time on and this basically is looking at you know how do you know what you if what you're reading is good research or not you know is this a piece of high quality research or is this just a piece of um, you know, commentary or opinion based kind of material, or is it an example of bad research or methodologically limited research? You know, so that's one of the things that we would have spent uh, some time on tonight. And throughout these videos that I've prepared for you, hopefully, you'll get a sense as to how to go about it because essentially this is the task that you have ahead of you in the journal article review assignment that is coming up uh, that's due next week so um, looking at the methodological screen you know what are you looking for um, there are a couple of things think lists off seven um, I wouldn't necessarily go through and, and look at all of these 
um, and I wouldn't necessarily agree with all of these, but it's a nice kind of model. Um, but essentially what you're looking at here is the research design, or a lot of people will just refer to this as the methodology. You know, are they doing a case study? Is it action research? Is it an ethnography? Is it uh, a randomized control trial? Or is it a quasi-experimental model? You know, what kind of design are they using to inform their research? And how much information do they tell you about that design? The second is the sample. Essentially, this refers to how they get people, or sampling, I should say. Uh, the sample are the people that participate in the study. So sampling, or in some cases it's called sampling procedure, refers to how did they get those people. Um, when you're looking in Think, she talks about a couple, in, in the next couple of screens they'll um, go through and talk about some of these specifically, um, but she mentions randomized control and parallel control and um, convenient sample as some of the ones that you would have in there. And um, there are others that I'll mention when we get to those screens. The next thing to look at, and this is an important one in my opinion, is the data collection methods. Um, in addition to the research design, the data collection methods, and number five, the data analysis methods, really those should be done to a level where an informed reader would be able to replicate what the person is saying. So as you're reading through a study, if you knew what the term ethnography meant, and if you knew what was involved with a participant observation and then life story interviews, and then if you knew how to go about doing a narrative analysis, you know, so if you understood what was meant by all of those terms in terms of, you know, from a methodological perspective, does the author describe those things at a level where you would be able to replicate the study? And if the answer is yes, then that's a, usually the hallmark of a well-written methodology and, in all honesty, likely a reasonably well-conducted study. Um, you know, some of the other things that Fink mentions here, um, interventions are the nature of the program, the results are what they found, and then the conclusions. You know, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, as part of our practical screen, we're going to be looking through the abstract and the conclusions first as a way of determining whether or not we should, you know, spend more time with a particular article. And some of these seven components, in particular, I would say one, two, three, and five are things that you would want to use as a way of a methodological screen. So determining whether or not this is something that is going to be really useful towards your literature review, this is going to be somewhat useful towards your literature review, or this is likely not going to be that useful towards your literature review. And you can usually judge that based upon the quality of the research that's being done. So let's look at a couple of these in particular. So um, think comes at this from a very quantitative perspective. So all of the terms that she's using and all of the examples she provides in her chapter are very much from a numbers or a statistical kind of perspective. The idea that um, you know, if we were doing this course at a doctoral level, I would have said at a very objectivist perspective or an objectivist paradigm, essentially a particular perspective that believes that the truth is absolute and we should be able to find it as long as we can design a study that has sophisticated and sensitive enough instruments that we would be able to determine it. It's really sort of that bedrock kind of scientific idea that you know, if you can understand how variables interact, you can develop a model. If you can use that model in an explanatory way, then you can develop a theory. Then you can test that theory, and if you can prove that theory, it becomes a law. If you can't disprove that theory, it continues to be a theory. Um, you know, that kind of model is that objectivist kind of model, and that's really where Fink is coming from. So a lot of the examples she's looking at here um, are kind of in that model. Now, in all honesty, within educational research, it's actually the constructivist model that is the more dominant model, and this is the belief that truth is more of a relative concept, and that you know, there are certain things that we simply can't 
prove because we will never have the ability to develop instruments that are sophisticated enough and sensitive enough to be able to definitively prove something. And this gets into that conversation we had in week one when we were talking about the material that Hattie was presenting. Um, you know, that idea that there are many variables that affect how a child interacts, performs, their perceptions, their attitudes, their aptitudes, what have you, within an educational context. And the ability to just do as, for example, Fink has shown with this particular example of a research design that she's got on this screen, where you have you know two groups one gets some kind of intervention one gets a control and if you do a test before and a test after that if there's any difference between group one and group two that it was the new program that caused that difference now that is a very objectivist perspective um, towards you know an educational design and as educators we all know that the things that will influence the students scores in both groups and one probably have more to do with things outside of the classroom and outside of your instruction than whatever new program and traditional programs are um, so but I mention that because as you look through Fink's uh, chapter she really does come at it from this paradigm that essentially if group one here scored better or the increase from test before and test afterwards was greater in group one which had the new program than it was for group two say there was a difference between the before and after with group one of fifteen while there was only a difference in group two of four think and folks that come from that objectivist paradigm would say that well new program caused three times the amount of increase almost four times the amount of increase in these particular students so we should all be using the new program um, you know, and again, I think as educators, we all understand how flawed a model that is. So when you're looking at things like the research design, one of the things that you want to keep in mind is not necessarily using the characteristics that Fink has outlined here as whether or not it's a good piece of research, but essentially, do they explain the design at a level that you would be able to replicate it? And if you were familiar with that design, which, at least for one of them, you will all become familiar, very familiar with the design you choose for your own thesis when we get to 690. Essentially, um, you know, did they follow the normal principles of that? You know, do you see them citing people that are associated with that methodology? For example, if you're using case study, are they citing people like Miriam or Stake? or Yin, or Bassey, or some of those other folks that are well-known within the field. And while you might not know who's well-known in the field, looking for that citation when they say, I am using a case study methodology, or the researchers used, or the study was designed around a case study research design, looking to see, is there a citation to support that? Because that'll give you a good sense as to, you know, whether or not they're actually following along by what these methodological experts recommend. Um, you know, so as you're going through this, uh, Again, note that the all of the examples that Fink are providing, so this randomized control trial, uh, these experimental design kinds of models, and we talked about this quasi-experimental model, which is the one we tend to see in education because we can't truly randomize, um, is, you know, that's one of the, the many different research designs. Um, the ones that you will tend to see from a, a more... Um, educational perspective oftentimes will focus more upon things like case study or a um, a um, ethnography or action research in fact case study and action research are probably two of the most common ones that you will likely come across as you're looking through these things um, beyond the methodology one of the things that you'll want to look at and see as you go through is this idea of um, validity, actually reliability and validity. So you'll want to see both of them there. Um, you know, what types of things are the researchers doing to ensure the reliability and validity of their study? Now, essentially, um, 
what you're looking at with reliability and validity are basically how can we be sure that the what you're finding is actually what is happening in the situation and how can we be sure that what you are measuring is being accurately measured so those are two things that you want to sort of keep in mind now when you're looking at a quantitative uh, study that's using quantitative methods oftentimes there's a specific statistical procedure that you would use to determine reliability and validity or um, particularly validity um, uh, sorry, particular reliability. So you're looking to see if they're using a Cronbach Alpha um, is the statistical procedure that tends to get used. Um, typically speaking, when you're looking at um, m research that's using more qualitative methods, you're looking at things like are they using triangulation? Are they using things like member checking? Do they maintain an audit trail? Um, so there are a number of different techniques that you would see folks using. Are they doing peer debriefing, for example? Um, are they providing thick, rich description in their results? You know, these are all techniques that you would use if you were using qualitative methods as a way of working with the reliability and validity of a particular study. So as you're reading through your studies, particularly those that you're reading a little bit more closely, one of the things you're looking for is not necessarily for you to be able to determine is what they're doing good, but are they talking about reliability and validity? Do you see them mention any of that in there? Is there some aspect of techniques that they're using to ensure the reliability and validity of their studies um, to allow essentially the reader to have the confidence that the researchers are doing essentially what they're supposed to be doing in order to provide you with a good study you know and you know that last line that you see there on slide 20 from Fink here um, if the data you report are based on flawed studies you're reporting misleading and false information you know and so the idea that you know you want to have some sense of you know are these studies talking about reliability and validity um, are they doing things to ensure that um, essentially their studies are reliable and valid because if they're not then chances are the conclusions that you're drawing from your literature review are either wrong or are at be at worst or sorry at best misleading um, you know so the other thing that you want to pay attention to is the notion of sampling now again think coming at this from largely a quantitative perspective is going to be more interested in essentially how many folks are being sampled uh, if Fink was more of a qualitative person the number of people in the sample wouldn't be that important but what you'd be looking for is how you know what was the sampling procedure how did they go about getting those people into the sample um, as I mentioned you know when you look at uh, Fink she talks here really about a couple of different types and they're mostly focused upon what we'd see in more of a, a quantitative kind of model and um, you know so for example she on this slide here she talks about two different types of randomized sampling and when you're using quantitative uh, methods random sampling is actually a, uh, a useful tool uh, to use particularly if you're able to do a true randomized or a stratified randomized um, kind of model because it will increase the statistical power of your study. Um, you know there are other forms the other two that Fink talks about and if you're in the the textbook here now again with the fourth edition she's really up here in pages 81 through 80 um, I guess actually right up to page 90 um, so 81 to page 90 talking about sampling um, you know there's systematic sampling where you pick like every fifth person um, you will see that essentially when you're looking at qualitative research a lot of it will use convenient sampling uh, for many of you your thesis studies will be a convenient sample because it's essentially people that you have access to you know they're just convenient to you one of the types of sampling uh, that Fink doesn't mention um, is um, snowball sampling 
Uh, snowball sampling is basically when you have identified a group of participants either through random chance or because you intentionally went out to get them or because they just happen to be convenient to you and then essentially you ask them for additional recommend you know additional people that you could talk to it's called snowball sampling because it's kind of like if you have a snowball at the top of a mountain and you just let it roll down the hill it kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it rolls down that's the idea behind it that you know if you start off with two or three people and they all recommend another one or two people and all of a sudden you've got you know instead of two or three now I've got maybe six to nine and those six to nine people will generate me up to um, another eighteen to twenty seven people and so on and so forth uh, another type of sampling that Fink doesn't mention so a second type that Fink doesn't mention is purposeful sampling and within qualitative research it's convenient and purposeful that you'll tend to see used Mo or techniques that are your procedures that are used most often when you're see when you're using qualitative methods. Um, a purposeful sample is basically people who are picked intentionally because of who they are within a particular context. So oftentimes, for example, if you are working in a school and there is a teacher that is known to be, you know, really technically savvy, and the students are always talking about, you know, all the things he does in the classroom and in his teaching with technology, and if your study was focusing upon technology integration in the classroom, picking him for the very reason that, you know, he's got this reputation and both amongst the staff and the students. That's a purposeful choice to pick a, an, an individual or a group of individuals for your study. So that's a purposeful sample and you could have you know multiple types of sampling so you might have a purposeful snowball sample or a purposeful convenient sample. Um, you know, so these are some of the things to keep in mind as you're reviewing your articles that you're looking through, you know, do they mention some kind of sampling procedure? Most studies will give you information about the sample. They'll tell you, you know, that we surveyed students who were, you know, age 16 to 18 in these three parts of the state or in these four states or what have you. But do they talk about the procedure that was used to determine who was being asked to participate in the first place? And that's the idea about sampling that you want to focus upon. So that takes us to the end of this uh, presentation. And um, hopefully you found it uh, somewhat useful and um, somewhat accompanying what you read in Fink as opposed to simply just summarizing what you read in Fink.